and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that'll rot your brain like crack cocaine. And of course, that's a phrase that I think a lot of us, uh, certainly American 80s and or 90s kids, heard quite a bit growing up. And of course, that was regarding television. And don't you just hate it when it turns out your parents were right? So anyway, last November, I did a video on bad 80s syndicated sitcoms. And in that video, we took a look at three sitcoms from the latter half of the 1980s. And this time we're going to do it again, but we're going to move forward. Uh, we're going to move this concept kicking and screaming into the 90s, specifically the 1990 to 93 range. Now, once again, I have three sitcoms lined up for you here, one of which was all new at the time, maybe not terribly original, but all new, not based on anything in particular. One was an adaptation of a movie, and one was a reboot of an old series. So, yeah, Hollywood's been doing that recycling thing for quite some time. Actually, they'd been doing it for quite some time already, even back then. Anyway, let's kill off some of those pesky brain cells, shall we? I love you even if you preach too big. Thank you for calling the Los Angeles Police Department Bomb Disposal Squad. All of our lines are busy, but if you will stay on, one of our trained bomb disposal experts will assist you. Are. Okay, let's get the worst one of the lot out of the way. But to build up to it, back in the mid-80s, a couple of Michael Nesmith's old Pacific Arts compatriots, namely director William Deere and songwriter-turned-voice actor-turned-tragically-hip-sophisticate Bill Martin, came up with a suitably screwy idea that they hoped they could develop into a sitcom. It eventually happened. Well, in the comedy adventure Harry and the Hendersons, a nice suburban family stumbles upon the real McCoy with a resounding thud. Of course, this idea, Harry and the Hendersons, was pared down to just a movie, which was released in June of 1987 and became a moderate box office hit. Now, I haven't seen this movie in many years now, but if memory serves, it was already a 90-minute 80s sitcom episode. A family hits Bigfoot, if you will, with their car, and the hairy creature, uh, not John Lithgow, becomes one of the family. Given the rather thin premise, whatever comic potential there was, was unsurprisingly already expended in the movie. Didn't stop Universal from pursuing it as a sitcom, though. Care for a Bigfoot. You must walk him. Feed him. Whether it was overconfidence or just Universal throwing its weight around, a sitcom version of Harry and the Hendersons was greenlit in 1990 with a 72 episode guarantee, with 130 plus TV stations across the US agreeing to run all 72 episodes. In other words, this sucker was getting three seasons. Good, bad, or indifferent. Harry and the Hendersons. From there down, you just too much feet. Your feet's too big. Don't want you cause your feet's too big. Can't you use you cause your feet's too big. Harry and the Hendersons debuted in January of 1991 to only a few reviews. As best as I can gather, all negative and I'm hard-pressed to disagree. The cast just seems to exist. And, uh, hey, don't I know that daughter from somewhere? I've got to have this. Hey! Boo! Anyway, most of this series, as of this episode, is available for viewing on YouTube via old off-air recordings, and as such, I was able to take in a decent cross-section of the show's run. 
Aside from the best jokes already being in the movie, the show's number one problem is how astoundingly bland it is, especially given the premise. Apparently the writers knew it too. By the end of the show's run, the cast ballooned from just Harry and the four Hendersons to some attic kids, a spare in-law, goofy neighbors, ditzy foreign household help, I think, and even a second Bigfoot. Yeah, characters have a way of just appearing and disappearing from this show. Speaking of appearing and disappearing, the one and only holdover from the movie was Harry himself, played by Kevin Peter Hall. Hall died at the age of 35, partway through the first season, thanks to a contaminated blood transfusion he received after being in a car wreck. To add insult to injury, Hall stood at an astounding 7 foot 2 inches. Hall's successor, Dowen Scott, I hope I pronounced that right, was a few inches shorter. Scott bailed after season 2. Scott's successor, Brian Steele, was a few inches shorter than that. In other words, Harry inexplicably shrank 7 inches in a little over 2 years. Most of the TV stations that ran this show stuck it in that no man's land that is the Soul Train spot. Read the time slot right after the Saturday morning cartoons ended. As for me, I was blissfully unaware of this show, largely because even at six years old, I was watching Soul Train. Not a joke. With the hottest jams and scars in the world, you'll meet our first exciting guest, Front of me, MCA recording star, Charlie Wilson. Too quiet. So what have you been working on? Oh, just some stuff. It's nothing special, kind of a diary. While the series quietly ended in 1993, with few, if any, U.S. reruns, the show managed to roll on in reruns into the 2000s over in Europe. The ultra-hammy German-dubbed version is far funnier than the regular English version, even if I don't understand a word. Das wird nicht gesagt. Ist das nicht riesig? <lacht> It's way up there to the right hand side of the dial. Just twist the knob till it stops, <laughs> and we should come in loud and clear. Remember, if WKRP doesn't come in on your car radio, you need a better car. TV series reboots, even back then, were nothing new. Uh, hell, there'd already been a Blondie and Dagwood reboot in the late 60s, of which the original 50s sitcom was a reboot of the old Blondie movies from the 30s and 40s, and of of course, it had been a comic strip before that. Anyway, as for WKRP in Cincinnati, everyone should know the existing sitcom already, but just in case you don't, you uncultured swine, here's a quick rundown. WKRP, the call letters implying W-crap, is a poor-performing, easy-listening radio station, and uh, take a wild guess where it's based out of, which is run by an assortment of goofballs and incompetence. A new program director gets hired, the format gets switched to rock, the new PD brings along some goofy friends of his own, and wackiness ensues for four seasons. Having said that, as far as I'm concerned, it is one of the great workplace comedies. Good jokes, sympathetic characters, and, given the radio setting, some excellent song choices. Who was that Pink Floyd? <laughs> do I hear dogs barking on that thing? I do. KRP comes back to Channel 9. As God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. 
By the early 90s, the original WKRP, which ran from 1978 to 82, had become something of a rerun staple. To the point where, according to original writer Bill Dial, stations were asking if there were more episodes that were being held back from syndication. Obviously someone at MTM, who owned the original series, was listening, and decided it was time to return to the airwaves. Three original cast members, Gordon Jump as Mr. Carlson, Richard Sanders as Les Nessman, and Frank Bonner as Herb Tarlick, returned full-time. Appropriately enough, the three WKRP lifers from the original run, and the most incompetent of the lot. This time around, it appears that the station is sunk for good, but two of the old-timers, Lonnie Anderson as Jennifer Marlowe and Howard Hessman as Dr. Johnny Fever, swoop in to save the day. From there, it's pure deja vu. A new program director is brought in, McKelty Williamson, better remembered as Bubba in Forrest Gump. Some new DJs are brought in, uh, among them Tawny Katane. Uh, no Jaguar hoods involved, alas and future Third Rock from the Sun star French Stewart. And, uh, yeah, the station then effectively picks up where the old crew had left off nine years earlier, including Dr. Johnny Fever on a semi-regular basis. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, that is the original set. It somehow managed to survive the intervening years intact. America's favorite first-run comedy is taped before a studio audience of very strange people. Given the reputation of the original series, this one was pretty well doomed to a negative reaction, which in my opinion is a shame. As of my making this, most of the series is available for viewing on YouTube via old off-air recordings, and it's not too bad. Is it as good as the original? No. But the chemistry among the old cast is firmly intact. By the end of the first season, after a little shuffling, the new crew settles into a decent enough groove, and every now and then, an original series-worthy episode does pop up, the episode revolving around the death of unseen overnight DJ Moss Steiger is an especially good slice of black comedy. Steiger, I guess I'm dead. <laughs> That's right to the point, doesn't he? Well, it's been a great life. If you can call never seeing daylight great, or never having a wife and family, or never making any real money at this broken down radio station. WKRP. Got kind of tired of packing and unpacking. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the new WKRP only lasted two seasons, running from 1991 to 93. Somewhat alarmingly, the final episodes are kind of a mess. Almost like everyone knew it was over and chaos ensued on the set. The program director character is abruptly written out, Tawny Katane's character just vanishes for the last several episodes, and neither are ever mentioned again, and other cast members had vanished before that already. The final episode ends on a decent-ish note, with station sales manager Herb Tarlick renewing his wedding vows, with Edie McClurg returning from the original series, in front of the now-reduced cast. Around the time the series ended, cable music channel VH1 picked up the existing 45-ish episodes for reruns, with the option to run them as late as 1998. To the best of my knowledge, VH1 gave up on those reruns by the end of 93. As best as I can gather, the series has, YouTube notwithstanding, remained buried ever since. Cincinnati premieres on VH1 Monday, September 6th at 7. I'm sure he was a great man. I wish the boys could have met him. They will today. <laughs> Admittedly, today's last entry is one I've only been able to catch an episode and a half of. I hated the full episode, and loved the half episode I found. 
But before we get to that, today's last sitcom is, thanks to the internet, considered one of the supreme failures of sitcoms in general. Of course, the mid and late 80s had been the heyday of the surrealist sitcom, uh, a la Alf and Small Wonder, so it's easy to see why this show, debuting in 1990, was seen as a last gasp in the trend. The show in question is What a Dummy, lasting for one 24 episode season starting in September of 1990. You're kicking yourselves because it's so obvious. I guess ALF would be the best parallel I could draw to this series. Of course, ALF was a space alien living on the down low with a normal suburban family, all the while becoming the resident smartass of the household. In this case, the distant family of a deceased vaudeville ventriloquist, namely the Brannigans, are the sole survivors of the bloodline and, by default, inherit his estate, which consists of a single trunk. In the trunk is a living, breathing ventriloquist's dummy named Buzz, who proceeds to become the resident smartass of the household. Now, whereas Alf, the character, was usually rightly the center of attention, from what I've seen and read of this series, Buzz largely seems to exist to comment on an otherwise totally bland family sitcom, which might have been okay if the commentary was any good. Of course, given that Buzz looked like something straight out of Tales from the Crypt, not to mention coming soon after Child's Play, you'd think they'd have played up that angle. They don't. Come to think of it, a guest appearance by Jay Johnson and Bob and or Willie Tyler and Lester would have been a welcome dose of surrealist humor as well. How am I going to pull this one off? Well, you're not. But you'd have to turn into Corey. Wait a minute. Wait, that's it. If anyone of any note came from this show, it would have been effective star Stephen Dorff who's gone on to become a pretty well-known character actor. And despite the poor material, Dorf does turn in some solid performances. Conversely, the going theory is that it just about killed off what was left of comedian Kay Ballard's career, who played the token next-door neighbor, and appears in none of the currently circulating footage. In the greater scheme of things, and I mean this in the nicest way possible, I think we can safely say it was merely a blip on the radar of Ballard's career. Oh. Sweetheart, if the funeral is going to be too upsetting for you, then you don't have to go. I mentioned earlier that I hated the full episode I saw and loved the half episode I saw. The half episode was the first half of the pilot, right up until Buzz's debut. Natch. In the pilot, we get to attend the funeral of the deceased vaudevillian uncle, which I thought was pretty funny. Held in an uh, arts club, which doubles as a bingo parlor and probably several other things, the ceremony is poorly presided over by the late great satirist Pat Paulson, the only politician we endorse at the archive, I might add. And the mourners are some of the late ventriloquists' contemporaries, some of whom really are, and by that point quite elderly, vaudevillians. Like Learning the Ropes and its wrestlers, uh, see my last sitcoms episode, I think I'd rather have seen the old vaudevillians become a part of the regular show and seen those relationships develop, especially with regards to the mostly square Brannigan family. But no, the complete episode I saw, number four to be exact, is a thoroughly bland family sitcom, with Buzz only existing to fill the opening scene and inject the occasional, usually pretty weak, wisecrack thereafter. If my reading on this show is anything to go by, it looks like those episodes were the norm. Shame, because this could have easily been a Get-A-Life-esque cult classic. 
I can't find any great period resources on this show, but I'd be willing to bet pretty heavily it ran in a few mostly major markets and over in Europe and used as a filler and vanished quicker than a bad vaudeville magic act. That's showbiz. Yeah? What's the bad news? Um... <laughs> Well, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I teach all you cable subscribers, or stealers, I don't discriminate, how to escape the doldrums of being stuck watching crappy sitcoms on basic cable and get you into watching the good stuff on... <laughs> premium cable, if you get my drift, all by using nothing more than a simple penny. Granted, this lesson probably would have been a lot more valuable back in 93. Harry and los Henderson Way up north in a house that's new There were four of me, your big feet and you from your ankle up, I'd say you sure is free. From there down, you just too much. Con las actuaciones de It's too big. Bruce Davison. No want you cause your feet too big. Molly Chick. Can't you use you cause your feet too big. Noah Blake. I love you cause your feet too big. Zachary Bostrom. Oh, your feet too big. Caroline Plante. No want you cause your feet too big. Connie Belvin. Scott.